Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Unwanted Attention. So in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the chilling stalking case of Dr. Jan Walkowski. This case has loads of twists and turns, and it was described by investigators as one of the worst cases of harassment that they'd ever investigated in their entire careers. There are a few things in this world more unnerving than the idea of having a stalker. Despite its prevalence, stalking still remains one of the most difficult crimes to define. And that's mostly due to the fact that stalkers use imaginative methods of stalking and harassment, methods that on the surface can look pure and innocent. With the introduction of text messaging, stalkers found new and more inventive ways to reach their victims without ever needing to leave their own home. One massive misconception surrounding stalking is that it will gradually stop over time. The truth is that sometimes, that obsession can begin to transform. And instead of focusing on a romantic relationship with their victim, the stalker instead wants to see their victim suffer. In 2002, a chance meeting at a London hospital led to such a terrifying scenario. Dr. Jan Walkowski was an esteemed psychiatrist from the City of London. He worked at St. Clement's Hospital in East London, where he was known as a polite and skilled psychiatrist. Dr. Walkowski was also a former peacekeeper, who had spent some time with the UN in Bosnia during the 1990s. In his free time, he liked to race powerboats, and in 2001, he set the record for the fastest circumnavigation of Britain. It was while partaking in this hobby that Dr. Walkowski met Deborah Pemberton, an accountant at the London headquarters of Debenhams. The couple were absolutely smitten, and after dating for just a couple of weeks, Dr. Falkowski proposed. Deborah immediately said yes. On New Year's Eve of 2001, their engagement was publicised in an NHS magazine that was available to all patients. The next couple of months passed in a whirlwind for the couple as they prepared for their upcoming wedding. Around a year before their wedding date, the couple began to receive strange text messages from unfamiliar phone numbers. One sent to Dr. Falkowski read, You'll never know how much I felt for you over the last four years. At first, the couple tried to ignore the messages. They were clearly from somebody who had developed a crush on Dr. Falkowski. But the messages only continued. Over time, they began to contain eerily accurate and detailed information about the couple's movements as well as information regarding their families. It was evident that whoever the text messages were from, they certainly knew the couple, or an even more terrifying scenario, they had been watching the couple. After a couple of months of incessant text messages, Dr. Falkowski and Deborah reported the text messages to Dorset Police. They had tried to call the phone number, but curiously, it never rang. Police were able to establish that the text messages were coming from various phone boxes, and they advised the couple to keep a log of every single text message they received of that nature. Whoever the text messages were from, Dr. Falkowski and Deborah felt confident that the harassment would eventually cease. It never crossed their minds that whoever the text messages were from, they would branch out and begin to harass them physically, or that things would turn violent. To them, they had thought it was just some weird oddball who had developed an infatuation that would pass with time. At least that's what the couple thought until the end of October 2002, when Dr. Falkowski and Deborah returned to the boat where they lived in Limehouse Marina in East London. As they entered the boat, they found that the lights were switched on. They could have swore they turned them off before they left. Then when they entered the kitchen, they found that the gas cooker had been left switched on. Immediately, a paralyzing fear overcame the couple. They knew that it couldn't have been a mistake on their part because they had never once used the gas cooker. It must have been their stalker, giving way to an exceptionally chilling realization. Their stalker had progressed into the real world and into the fringes of violence. A couple of days later, their fears were confirmed when Dr. Falkowski received a text message that was extremely graphic in nature. It warned, two women may end up dead in Limehouse Pool. Let the tart go now. He knew immediately what this disturbing message related to. Around the same time, a woman's body had been found floating in the water at Limehouse Marina. Dr. Falkowski and Deborah became shells of their former selves as they worried about what their stalker would do next. These phone calls were almost always silent 
but on one occasion they received a voicemail from a woman with a Mediterranean accent. They racked their brains to try and identify the voice, but it didn't sound familiar to either of them. But surely their stalker must have known them. She knew far too many details about their lives to be a complete stranger. They scanned their minds to think of anybody they had encountered. Anybody that seemed overly interested in Dr. Falkowski. Or anybody who acted peculiarly, but they couldn't think of anybody at all. Over time, the couple came to dread the text message alert on their mobile phones. And then in August of 2003, Dr. Falkowski was preparing for a powerboat race when a colleague received a text message warning that there was a bomb on the boat. Obviously, he pulled out of the race straight away. Their lives were completely transformed as the harassment continued. Whenever they left their home, they were always looking over their shoulder to see if they were being followed. Whenever there was a knock on the door, they feared the worst. The couple held on to the hope that their stalker would get bored and eventually leave them alone. But they soon came to learn that their stalker was only just getting started. The stalking and harassment took an immense toll on the relationship of Dr. Falkowski and Deborah. And as their wedding date was drawing closer, the text messages became even more violent in nature, especially the text messages to Deborah. At one point, Deborah was receiving up to 10 messages a day, messages that were threatening violence. One warned that Deborah would be burnt down in her wedding dress, while another ominously read, Gunmen, ready to do you, bang bang bang, all you deserve. The level of violence only continued to rise with each text message. Another warned Deborah that she would be dead in two weeks and that she needed to prepare for her funeral, not her wedding. Dr. Falkowski was also bombarded with text messages in the lead up to the wedding date, but these never threatened violence against him. Instead, they advised him not to marry Deborah and threatened violence against her. One text message referred to Deborah as a false witch. In another text message, the unknown person wrote, Say no to vows on the 6th of the 9th 03 at Salterns. Your homes and marriage will never work. Whoever the messages were from, they were clearly determined to prevent the wedding from happening. Police were investigating the case, but they were really no closer to identifying a suspect than they were when they received the first report from the couple. Their lives were completely under siege as they worried about what the stalker would do next. In a bid to make the couple feel a bit safer at home, police fitted a panic button, but that did very little to despair the uneasiness that consumed their every waking moment. But their fears were escalated even further when on the day before their wedding, the head chef at Saltern's Hotel where the reception was due to be held received a text message that warned many will be dead if the wedding went ahead. Another message warned that the food to be served at the wedding had been poisoned. That same day, Dr. Falkowski received a text message which read, Your security arrangement is not working. Tart will pay a heavy price for your mistake. The person sending all of the messages was clearly unhinged, and Dr. Falkowski and Deborah not only feared for their own safety if the wedding went ahead, but the safety of their friends and family as well. What the stalker didn't know, however, was that Dr. Falkowski and Deborah had actually postponed their wedding. As Dr. Falkowski later recalled, because of the harassment and threats we received, we decided to postpone the wedding. Deborah and I had been talking about it for some time because of our concerns for our safety and everyone else's. The influx of threatening messages had clearly terrified the couple so much that they quietly cancelled the wedding. The couple had hoped that by cancelling the wedding and not informing anybody, they would be able to smoke out the stalker. They theorised that the stalker would be in pool on the day of the wedding, most likely staking out the wedding venue. Dr. Falkowski and Deborah had liaised with police who agreed that it was a wise decision. On what should have been their wedding day, a flurry of phone calls from the stalker came in to the couple, from both Bournemouth and Pool. As the phone calls came in, police officers staked out phone booths in the aforementioned towns. At around 12.20pm, a couple of police officers were staking out a phone booth in Pool when they observed a woman making 20 to 30 frantic text messages in the space of just two or three minutes. Simultaneously, Dr. Falkowski and Deborah received an influx of text messages from their stalker. Was the woman in the phone booth their stalker? It certainly seemed like it. The police officer swooped in and they arrested her on the spot. In her pocket, they found £12 worth of coins, further solidifying their belief that they had caught the right woman. Dr. Falkowski was brought down to the police station to see if he could identify her. He recognised her, but only barely. 
Back in 1998, Dr. Falkowski was at work in St. Clement's Hospital when one of his clients came in to be treated. George Adderd had been a client of Dr. Falkowski for around four years. This afternoon, he was accompanied to his appointment by his then girlfriend, a woman from Argentina named Maria Marches. It was a routine appointment and nothing out of the ordinary happened. But after Marches and her boyfriend left that afternoon, the lives of Dr. Falkowski, Deborah Pemberton, and even Maria Marches would be forever changed. After finishing up his shift, Dr. Falkowski returned home, and he thought nothing of the appointment. Marches, however, went home and she couldn't stop thinking about Dr. Falkowski. Over the next four years, she accompanied George to as many appointments with the doctor as possible. Then when she learned of his engagement to Deborah, her infatuation developed into a disturbing obsession. The campaign of harassment had left Dr. Falkowski and Deborah in turmoil. The level of intrusion into their lives was completely unrepairable, and even with their stalker behind bars, the relationship disintegrated. Just a month after what would have been their wedding day, Dr. Falkowski and Deborah split up. Upon going their separate ways, Deborah never heard from Maria Marches again, but Dr. Falkowski wouldn't be so lucky. With Maria Marches in jail, Dr. Falkowski felt a sense of relief, but unfortunately, it would be fleeting. On the 8th of December 2003, the Crime Prosecution Service informed him that they had decided not to pursue the case against Marches. They never offered any proper explanation, other than to say that they weren't convinced that they would receive a successful prosecution. Marches was released from custody, and within just days, Dr. Falkowski received a threatening phone call at work. He identified the person on the other end of the line as none other than Maria Marches, and he reported her to police. Marches was contacted by police, and she agreed to speak with them. As it transpired, she had another perverse tactic up her sleeve. At the police station, Marches claimed that Dr. Falkowski had raped her at St. Clement's Hospital two years earlier. She then informed the officers that she still had the underwear that she was wearing during the alleged attack, and she had brought it along to the police station with her. She handed it over to police and they placed it into an evidence bag to be sent away to be forensically tested. In December of 2004, the DNA results were finally back, and they found that there was traces of Dr. Falkowski's DNA on Marches's underwear. The stalking case against Marches was immediately dropped, and police descended on Dr. Falkowski's home, where they arrested him on suspicion of rape. He was stunned, and he denied the accusations. He said to the police officers that he had never even been alone in a room with Marches, and he had only ever met her a handful of times. He suggested that Marches had rummaged through the bins outside his home, and then collected a used condom for the purpose of framing him. For Dr. Falkowski, it was the only logical explanation. His professes of innocence weren't enough, and he was transported to jail to be booked on charges of rape. Dr. Falkowski was subsequently released on bail, and he was defiant in his innocence, but the damage was already done. His life was crumbling all around him, and he was living under a cloud of suspicion. His relationship was over, his career was on the line, he was sure that Marches had somehow framed him, he just needed to prove it. Dr. Falkowski turned to his defence team and they ordered further DNA testing on the underwear. The results showed the presence of other DNA that did not come from sperm. Further testing on this DNA showed that it was from Beth and Ansel, Dr. Falkowski's new girlfriend. It was an astounding turn of events and in August of 2005, the Crown dropped the case against Dr. Falkowski and he was formally acquitted by a judge. This gave way to a brand new investigation an investigation into Maria Marches. This investigation finally blew open the lid on the years of harassment that Marches had inflicted on Dr. Falkowski and Deborah, with an investigator describing the ordeal as a doctor or psychiatrist's worst nightmare. Maria Marches was ultimately charged with threats to kill and harassment. She pleaded not guilty to all of the charges against her, and in July of 2006, her trial began. During the trial, Dr. Falkowski testified about the impact that Marches' actions had on his life. He stated, I was extremely concerned that somebody knew a great deal about me and what I was doing. Marches countered this testimony, claiming that she was innocent and that Dr. Falkowski was a rapist. 
She stuck to her claim that he had sexually assaulted her, with her defence attorney, Peter Higginson, telling the jury that Dr. Falkowski had weaved a massive and complex web of deception, which included having an affair behind Deborah's back when they were engaged. The affair had absolutely nothing to do with the case, but once again, Dr. Falkowski's personal life was splurged all across the newspapers, causing even further damage to his already shattered standing within the community. On the witness stand, he admitted that he had an affair with a woman named Bethan Ansel, who was his current girlfriend. Testimony then turned to the DNA that was found on Marchese's underwear, which matched both Dr. Falkowski and Bethan. Dr. Falkowski hadn't even met Bethan until the year after the alleged rape only further proving that Marches had in fact rummaged through his bin and collected a condom just to frame him. Ultimately, Maria Marches was convicted on four counts of harassment, making threats to kill and perverting the course of justice. While the conviction was a momentous moment for Dr. Valkowski, it was tinged with anguish. He had been put through four years of hell, and during those four years, Maria Marches had completely ruined his life and then ruined his career. He had lost clients, friends, and his reputation. Maria Marchese was sentenced to nine years in prison, and she also received a lifelong restraining order against Dr. Falkowski. The case of Dr. Falkowski highlighted issues within the legal system, which didn't extend anonymity in rape cases to the accused, as well as issues within the forensic science services, which essentially fumbled the original DNA testing. The case further highlighted problems within the Crime Prosecution Service, who had discontinued the original case against Marchese, which allowed her to then go on and make the rape accusations. The Crime Prosecution Service never gave an in-depth reason as to why the case was dropped. As mentioned, stalking is still widely misunderstood, and there have been some accusations that quite simply, they didn't take the case seriously, or maybe they didn't believe that a female stalker could be a real threat to a male victim. These three systems are put in place for our protection, and when they fail to work their way they're set up to work, there can be disastrous results. In the end, it was the victim, Dr. Falkowski, who paid the ultimate price. In an interview with the Times, he said, but stalking isn't over when the person is found guilty and sentenced. It's about what they do with the rest of their life, and I know that in the fullness of time she will be out. It's not something I want to think about at the moment. I'm trying to move on. But still, sometimes I worry if I see people watching me. I wonder whether they have seen my picture in the paper. It's not completely behind me. Being stalked is something you never forget about. Well, that is all for today's episode of Unwanted Attention. Please do share your thoughts on this case in the comment section below, 